so uh, welcome. This is the title of my talk, Building Stamina for Space. When you say stamina, it's the strength to endure. So essentially, how do we build this, the strength to endure and to continue our efforts uh, in space? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me begin by showing you the timeline of Philippine space technology development. It all started way back in 2013 when there was baseline research on space activities and infrastructure. A year after that, the first project or the first program, Philippine Microsat, was, is, was uh, started. And in this program was the development of Diwata 1. Okay? And in 2015, a National Space Development Program plan was submitted. In, uh, after uh, deploying uh, Diwata 1, immediately after, Diwata 2 was uh, um, developed together with, Diwata 1 and Diwata 2 were developed together with uh, Japanese collaborators. And it was deployed uh, in uh, uh, 2018. Uh, 2018. So, Diwata 1 was deployed 2016 and then Diwata 2 was deployed in 2018. Uh, also, on the ground, we have uh, begun uh, building ground receiving stations that can control and get data from satellites, not only from our satellites, but also from other international satellites. In 2018, the CubeSat uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter satellites were deployed, also built by uh, our Filipino engineers who were, were being trained in Japan, and it was deployed in 2018. And in six short years after the start of um, uh, baseline research, the Philippine Space Agency was established in 2019. Uh, sometime late 2018, the new Space Program for Local Capacity Development, Stamina for Space, was uh, started. And in this talk, I will tell about what we do in this uh, program. Uh, this program carries over from Field Microsat, and included in this program was the deployment of the other Maya Cube satellites and uh, the development of a larger uh, multispectral imager satellite. So let me talk some more about the Stamina for Space uh, program. Uh, Stamina stands for Space Technology and Applications Mastery, Innovation, and Advancement. And it gives the uh, message that we do need Stamina for Space. In a nutshell, it has four objectives, which I shorten to the following uh, statement. We want to build stamina for space. We want to be able to get data and analyze data from Earth-observing satellites. We need to build an industrial base that can support uh, building these high-reliability re high structures. We need to set up an environment for research and development. And to me, what's the most important of all is we need to develop people. So uh, the Stamina for Space has five projects under it. There is the optical project, and it is tasked to locally build space cameras. So it has to engage local industry so that we can build our own uh, optical payloads. So space cameras are also known as optical payloads uh, here in the Philippines and thereby engage local industries. The PHL-50 is the project that tries to build the satellite bus or the structure of the satellite that has what you can see is the, the solar cells and it is the one that holds the payload. Okay? Essentially, it, uh, it uh, has the computer as well that allows control of the satellite and the sensors and the communication with the ground station. Then we have the Step Up Project, and this project uh, trains scholars through uh, scholarship. Uh, there is a master's program 
uh, on, on nano satellites, and their training involves them, the, the scholars, building cubes, CubeSats themselves. Then there is the GRASS project, and this is for uh, downstream technologies. This is for getting the data and analyzing the data. And lastly, we have the fifth project, which is the Advanced Satellite Program. And this program builds the larger satellite, and it is the way to transition uh, from an academic setting, which the uh, stamina for space is, to the Philippine Space Agency. Now, let's go through those four things. Huh? So first, to build stamina for space, we should have the ability to get and analyze data from Earth-observing satellites. We should, be, we should be able to do this ourselves and not rely on other countries. So remember, please, that we have upstream and downstream technologies. When you say upstream technologies, these are the hardware that are up in space, the satellites, the payloads. And the downstream technologies are those on the ground, the ground receiving stations, and the data that is analyzed and studied. And so, to be able to get data and analyze it, you know, uh, data from space analysis, several sat uh, satellite antenna, ground receiving stations have been put up. And this is sort of the command center where we can get data. So, this looks like this. Perhaps if you see launches of of SpaceX or NASA, you see that they are in the command center and then they have several screens. It's something like this. You can see what's going on. You can send from here, you can send commands to the satellites to say, okay, when we pass by this place, take pictures. And then you can also tell it to download the data. So, for example, here are some uh, data downloaded from the Wata one as it passes over uh, uh, Mimaropa and uh, Calabarzon. We can also tell our satellites to point up and look at the moon. And so these are some images of uh, the Wata 2 taking a picture of the moon. And when we get the picture, what do we do with them? These are the low-hanging fruits of space technology because even if you don't have a satellite, if you can only get the images from the satellite and analyze them, if you can already extract so many benefits, you can extract actionable information from these satellites. Okay. So, for example, uh, look at this set of pictures. This was... Remember January 6, 2020? This was before the pandemic. And then March 8, if I remember correctly, we started having lockdowns. And this is a uh, Diwata 2 image of Mactan Cebu Airport on March 19, 2020. So a week after lockdown. As you can see, it is no longer busy. You don't see any airplanes. This is also Metro Manila in March 21, 2020. Okay. Normally, some streets here would be, uh, you would see cars running here, but because of lockdown, you would see the cars. The, another thing that you can do with satellite images is to monitor urban changes. Like, for example, uh, this is a series of images taken over uh, 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 one after the other. So one was taken in uh, 2001, if I'm not mistaken, and another was taken in 2008. So one can see the changes in the structure and one can do change detection. Have the roads been built? Have there been increase in houses, etc.? When there is disaster, we can also take a look at uh, the damage done and assess. Therefore, we can see where, uh, where we can uh, send assistance or see where uh, the situation is uh, occurring or, or developing. So here is a forest fire that happened also in uh, 2020 and this was uh, the ash fall that happened after Taal exploded in January. 2020 was such a hellish year, wasn't it? Okay, 
we can also monitor our water resources. So we can see here the turbidity of Manila Bay uh, at different times, as you can see here. And there are many, many other things that we can do once we get the data from Earth observing satellites. Okay. And here it just shows how much of the Philippines have been covered uh, by the satellites that we have. Remember, please, that not only can we get data from our own satellites, we can also get data from other international satellites. Okay. So this empowers us to be able to analyze data, get data ourselves, and analyze data. The next uh, step to build stamina for space is to build an industrial base, meaning if you're going to create high reliability and complex structures that should survive in space, then we should have companies that are able to fabricate these uh, uh, devices. Okay? Right now, these are the space assets of the Philippines. So, Diwata 1 uh, was launched in April 27, 2016. It has already been decommissioned. Maya 1, August 10. We have Diwata 2, still up there. This was what I was saying, that we can actually uh, get data from other satellites. We have a subscription to the NOVASAR. Uh, synthetic aperture radar. This is a special kind of sensor because it can see through clouds, it can see during nighttime. We didn't build this Nobasar satellite, but we can get data from it because we, sub we are subscribed to the data coming from these satellites. And these are the CubeSats. These are technology demonstration satellites that have been built by our scholars. And up in the horizon, we're building um, the 100 kilogram earth observing satellite MULA. Okay. And there are other, uh, other CubeSats being built as well. So, quickly, these are just the properties of Diwata 1. And it has many cameras. These are how the Maya 1 and other CubeSats from other countries uh, look like as they are, were released from the ISS. This is Diwata 2. It's a slightly heavier satellite and it still has many cameras. But in Diwata 2, what we did differently was that we added some of our own technologies, meaning we tried to put in Diwata 2 something that we did ourselves. Remember, please, uh, please note that Diwata 1 and Diwata 2 already have templates. They are satellites that already have heritage, meaning when we sent our engineers to Japan to learn how to build a satellite, the plans were already there. So they, they participated in assembling the satellite, integrating and testing the satellite. But the design was already there. So in the Diwata 2, what we wanted was to put in our own inventions, our own innovations. And so, uh, the Diwata 2 team built an amateur radio unit, an experimental attitude determination module, and an omnidirectional sun aspect sensor. We put it in uh, Diwata 2. Okay. And these uh, new sensors and uh, modules, some parts of these were built by local companies. And that's what we need to do. We have to engage the local industries. They have the systems, the um, facilities to build the, our design. Okay? We are also building cameras for remote sensing or for the satellite and even for drones. Because what we, did, what, what we were not able to do in the Wata 1 and the Wata 2 was to build cameras. There was already some company that was building the cameras based on our specification, and we wanted to learn how to build our own cameras. And so, uh, part of this research is building our own space cameras and cameras that can be uh, used by a drone. 
for industrial, or sorry, for agricultural uh, monitoring. As I said, when you build an industrial base, you have to engage, you have to work hard to try and find companies and engage them in the space technology. So we go to these companies. These are some of the companies that we go to and tell them, can you build this for us? Can you help us co-develop this particular part of the satellite? Okay. And that is what is actually being done in other space agencies uh, in the world. Okay. They engage local, their local industries to uh, participate in building space technology. The third is we, to build stamina for space, we would like to set up an environment for space research and technology. How is this different from the previous one when you set up an industrial base? When you say space R&D, which usually when you have an industrial base, you're looking for a return of investment. So when we engage companies, we tell them, okay, if you build this for us, this design for us, in the future, we can again hire you to build the succeeding uh, uh, components for us. And so they look forward to, to being the preferred company for a certain part of the space technology. Now, what about uh, an environment for space R&D? Okay. We would like to train people to be able to do space technology, whether upstream or downstream. And to do the training, we have to have facilities that let them test their uh, their, their uh, uh, um, uh, assemblies or their their components. So, for example, this is an anechoic chamber. Okay, it absorbs all sorts of audio signals and wind signals, so that we can only uh, detect. So there are no noise, there's not any noise coming from here, so it's very, very, very quiet room. It can be used for testing uh, CubeSats. As you can see here, the scholars are testing the CubeSats within this anechoic chamber. Okay. There is also, this by the way, is in the University of the Philippines. This is another facility. This is the research laboratory of the Ulysses uh, uh, University la uh, Laboratory. So the scholars, here are the uh, nanosatellite scholars, there's green room, there's a thermal vacuum chamber. There are, so there are equipment here and setups that allow our space scholars to test and develop their uh, technologies. Okay. There are also other laboratories under this program. For example, the Optical Payload Laboratory is where we develop the space cameras. Okay. We also develop our own hardware and software for training and testing. So, for example, the team uh, created a small satellite simulation system. As you can see here, an air bearing platform. So, this is very, uh, this is frictionless, a motorized gimbal, so that you can test. Because, you know, when you launch a satellite in space, it doesn't go like so. It actually tumbles a bit. Okay. And then there's this Helmholtz cage, which means uh, electromagnetic, uh, electric fields, isolates electric fields, etc. And these are um, tests that can be done on on components and there this was built by our engineers in-house okay we also for the training uh, and and for uh, uh, setting up an environment for space R&D there is also a chance for us to get data which which has already been done which are already downloaded from Iwata 1 and 2, so, so that uh, one can practice manipulating or analyzing this data. Okay? So anybody can request for data from these distribution platforms and practice analyzing them or uh, developing algorithms for them. 
Lastly, to build stamina for space, I think the most important component of all is to train people. Remember, technology can be obsolete, can become obsolete. But when you train people to be able to think for themselves, learn new things, work with others, then even if there is new technology, these people can learn it, these people can create new technologies themselves. And overall, this is the most worthy investment of all, training people. Here is a picture of the first training actually happened with our Japan collaborators. So we've sent our engineers and scholars to Japan to learn how to assemble, integrate, and test uh, satellites and payloads. You can see here, here they are assembling. I think this is the Watawa. Okay? Here's one of their mentors. So from this experience, we learn how to do it. Okay? And we try to do it here in the Philippines. And so our step-up scholars are building CubeSats, Maya 1, Maya 1 to 6, we have, we have building 6 CubeSats, are locally assembled. Of course, some of the space heritage parts are still coming from Japan, but slowly, slowly, we're trying to localize building these CubeSats. In fact, the printed circuit boards uh, and the structure of Maya 1 have been fabricated, uh, Maya 6, sorry, have been fabricated locally. So here are more pictures of the Step Up Scholars integrating and assembly, assembling, sorry, and testing the, the CubeSats that they built. Okay. And here's a snapshot of the people in the uh, Stamina for Space program. So you can see they are young people. Some of them are uh, graduates. Some of them are still studying. Some of them are professionals, meaning they resigned and they applied for the project to work in uh, these uh, space projects. Okay, So it's a good mix. As you can see, women and men, it's okay. They, they, we have lots of ladies in, in uh, the program. Okay. Well, I'm the uh, program leader. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. And my last two slides are the following. Of course, it's like preaching to the crowd when I talk about the benefits of satellite technology. But I'd just like to point out that, you know, going into uh, space and satellite technology leads to the development of a highly skilled workforce who can build high reliability systems. And it leads us to establish a local space industry. Okay. And... Through this, we can improve our STEM curriculum for K-12 to higher education. Through this, we can we can obtain the capability to collect data from Philippine and international satellites, and from this data, we can derive impactful information from remote sense data. Lastly, you might ask, so I'm excited. How how do I become how how, how to be part of the Philippine space activities? Are you a high school student or a college student? Then be good in STEAM. Hindi lang STEM. There's an A there. And that A there is for arts. Yes. You don't only, even if you are not science, technology, engineering, math, even arts contribute, can contribute to space activities. Okay? It's good if you can learn how to code. Because a lot of things, you can already, even if you're just a high school student, but you know how to code, you can already request for this data from the WATA 1, the WATA 2, and other satellites. Okay, there, some of them are fully downloadable, even data from NASA and other space agencies. And you can, if you can learn on your own how to code and how to use the other programs that other people have already uh, shared publicly and openly to analyze uh, space data, well, go ahead and try it on your own. You can also join hackathons. Do you know that there's a NASA hackathon? Uh, you can apply in space projects or OGTs if they're available. You can enter training or even enter competitions. Okay, so it's like you're you're still not a graduate. You're still training to be an engineer or scientist, an artist, a communicator, and on. Or you're still in high school, but that doesn't limit you from 
from already engaging in space activities. There are actually several space activities that even young people like you can already join in. Do you know that NASA periodically asks students, uh, grade school students even, any student at all, to suggest experiments for space? And the winning experiments is, are the ones that they do carry out in the International Space Station. Okay? So there are many avenues by which even if you're not yet a graduate, you can already dip your toes in space activities. Are you graduating or, or graduated already or already a professional looking for a career in space? You might think that, okay, the way to enter uh, space uh, uh, efforts is to join fields. Now. Of course, that's one. Okay, But that's not the only one. Do you remember the list of companies that we have already engaged to build products for our uh, satellites and our space cameras? If you join these companies, then that means it's possible that FILSA will engage these companies to uh, ask them to build the other parts for the future satellites and, uh, uh, and, and cameras. So you're not limited to entering FILSA. FILSA will employ companies that can deliver products uh, or services for uh, space technology. Okay? You can also join agencies that use remote sense data. There's DENR, Department of Agriculture, Pag-asa Field Box. And this is what I mean when you remember what I said about downstream technologies wherein uh, the data coming from the Earth observing satellites are obtained and analyzed. Okay? So these are just some examples of agencies that use these kinds of data. And you can join them. Or apply in them. Of course, as I said, there, there are graduate programs locally and internationally which are space related and they do give scholarships. So you can also try and enter these graduate programs. And lastly, remember I said that even if you're in the arts, you can also be part of humanities. No, you can also be part of space activities. Yes, we need good science communicators. So if you're, if you're very good in writing or you enjoy writing articles, making TikTok videos or uh, making vlogs about science, we need those. We need science communicators who can communicate or you can tell the public what are the benefits of uh, these space activities. Okay, so that ends my talk. Uh, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge all the, the agencies that have been our partner in the Stamina for Space program. There's, of course, the Department of Science and Technology, uh, UP Diliman, and departments or institutes under the, the uh, UP Diliman, and of course, uh, our partners in Japan, Hokkaido, and Tohoku University. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>